reminded of a person who, uh, going back two years ago, was very anxious to have the test done because he had very limited risk factors, but had risk factors, and was uh, overwhelmed with the anxiety of the possibility of a positive test. And when I inquired what he planned to do if the tests were positive, his answer was to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, people who haven't considered the possibility of dealing with the positive test really should not be tested until they've come to terms with that reality. Uh, if, though, if an individual chooses not to be tested, regardless of uh, their um, uh, state of mind, I think it's terribly important that they assume that they are positive and act accordingly in their personal lives to prevent a potential further transmission of this disease to others. So basically, safe sex guidelines are for everyone all the time. And I think that people who uh, choose not to be tested and who have no symptoms should assume that there's a significant possibility that they may be positive or their partner is positive and not make any assumptions about the pedigree of themselves or others that they're having uh, sexual contact with. And the same uh, recommendations apply obviously for other risk groups including heterosexual men and women and IV drug users. So I think it's important for everyone to be involved in disease prevention. Uh, the need to be tested is evolving in that as we develop more effective interventions for people who are HIV positive, uh, it makes more sense to find out where you stand. Now, at the current time, there's one approved therapy for uh, treating HIV infection of people who have significant immune deficiency, and that's AZT, and a variety of other therapies which are available, which we alluded to, that may or may not be effective, but certainly I think uh, belong in the menu of choices that people can make. As this menu increases and as we know more about drugs, the uh, desirability for being testing I think is going to increase. At the current time, it's really I think a personal decision and I think a decision that people have to make uh, in a very informed way. And I would also caution people to be careful if they are going to be tested that they consider uh, the, uh, make sure that there are assurances of confidentiality so that the test cannot be used in ways that may be potentially harmful for them. That means don't go to your boss and say you want to have an HIV test because you may have been exposed to AIDS, you know, so many months ago. Uh, there are certain instances where the test is important and it's becoming, I think, an important adjunct to medical care. Certainly if I'm caring for a patient who has an unusual illness, perhaps a fever of unknown origin, and uh, there's a possibility that this may be HIV related, it may be an important piece of information. Certainly, if a person is considering to um, father a child or travel to an area of the, of the world where they require HIV testing or donate a uh, kidney for a sibling who needs a renal transplant or apply for life insurance where they're going to test you whether you like it or not, uh, it may be to your advantage to know your antibody status before you're in such a situation. Uh, the information about what happens to HIV positive people is evolving with time. At seven years' time, approximately one-third of people who are HIV positive have become uh, ill with CDC definition AIDS. At 10 years' time, it's guesstimated, and I think reasonably accurately, that that may be 50 percent. No one can tell you 12 years, 15 years, or 20 years, and it's quite possible, if not probable, as Dr. Lang alluded to, that some people who are antibody positive may re re remain well symptom-free with normal T-cells for the rest of their lives. The problem is at this point in time, we don't know who they are, we don't know how to identify them. Um, and that basically is all I had to say about HIV antibody testing. Now there's this new test which uh, was alluded to during the conversation that I want to explain a little bit about. It's called the HIV antigen test or P24 antigen capture assay. This is a test that actually uh, was uh, is being produced by a, um, I think it's Abbott, Far uh, the Abbott Corporation, and its intent is to measure in a very sensitive way uh, virus present uh, or part of the virus present within the blood of individuals. And at least preliminary studies have shown that people who have uh, high levels of P24 antigen are more likely to have progression of illness than people who don't, and it kind of makes sense. If someone has a positive antibody test but there's no virus in their blood, they're more likely to remain well for long periods of time. If the virus is active and is replicating, the possibilities of progression are significantly higher. 
the test may have utility in following people with antiviral therapy or uh, immunomodulating therapy. If you can show that people who are P24 positive drop their levels of P24 with time, then we can assume that this may be indicative of improved uh, functional status. So it's currently now a research tool. Uh, it's not a tool useful to determine if you're antibody positive, if you're infectious. And the reason is that infectivity isn't a constant. We know that people who are HIV positive may be intermittently infectious during various periods of time. And there's no good way to know if uh, someone who's antibody positive is infectious today and not infectious tomorrow. And it would be very difficult, I think, to use a test, to, uh, it, this sort of a test, to make that kind of assumption. Um, so basically, the P24 capture, uh, antigen capture test is a test that uh, is new. It may have relevance in terms of predicting outcome, and it may be important in terms of modulating efficacy of therapy. The second question is, what does a person do who's HIV positive? What you know, evaluations should you have? And uh, the question was raised, what uh, various immunological tests should be performed? I think a more important question is, that person needs to be evaluated medically, both in terms of a good history and a good physical. Uh, T cell tests should not be done in a vacuum. And it's very, very clear that there are a number of predictive physical findings and predictive symptoms that uh, bode good or bode poorly for a person who's exposed and uh, HIV positive. Uh, quite honestly, I'd be more concerned about a person who had, uh, let's say, 400 T4 cells who has night sweats and fevers and thrush and weight loss and uh, is dragging around than someone who has 150 T4 cells whose weight is fine, who's uh, you know, functionally normal, and who has none of these obvious symptoms. Just a word about T4 cells and the uh, T cell subsets. We keep alluding to this as sort of the most important test. But at best, it's a reflection, a very indirect reflection of what's going on in terms of your immune system. And I've been struck by the tremendous inconsistencies of T cell testing, especially over brief periods of time. It's a little bit like measuring your pulse. You know, if you uh, go jogging and measure your pulse, it's obviously going to be greater than when you first wake up. T cells are similarly very dynamic, and you really can't base a lot of predictive value on a single T cell test. So it's more important of trends over a period of time. Uh, and for that reason, I discourage people from making uh, major decisions about what they're going to be doing based on a single T cell test. <laughs> there are a variety of other tests that actually are much less expensive and are quite useful in terms of uh, determining if people have uh, potential problems. Uh, I think it's important when people are evaluated, in addition to having a careful history and examination, that uh, a complete blood count, including a platelet count, which are cells responsible for clotting, uh, serum globulin levels, a chemistry screen, uh, a test obviously for anemia, et cetera, all of these things have important predictive value. So there's no one test that's the gold standard. And in fact, uh, with AIDS, the, uh, I think T-cell testing, which we're using as the gold standard, is more like the stock market. And I think that uh, caution, it should be uh, adhered to. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I think is appropriate uh, medical intervention for people who are HIV positive and who may have some T-cell abnormalities and or other signs or symptoms of HIV infection. Uh, there's developing, and I think this is an evolving process, a number of things that we consider to be good medicine for people who are HIV positive and have some immune deficiency. It's probably a good idea, especially if someone has risk, to be tested for tuberculosis. Not that a skin test for tuberculosis is necessarily always going to be reliable, but if it's positive, it indicates a significant risk of developing TB into the future. So that's a, either a time test or something called a PPD, which most uh, physicians can do in their office. It's also becoming appreciated that a number of killed vaccines, specifically the influenza vaccine and the pneumovax vaccine, which is a vaccine against uh, pneumococcal pneumonia, which is a bacterial pneumonia that people who are HIV have a higher risk for, may be appropriate for patients with uh, uh, HIV disease who are immune deficient. The uh, uh, subnote on this, or the footnote, is that it's very probable that people who have immune deficiency may respond suboptimally to.
to these vaccinations and may not have the kind of protection that otherwise normal people may develop. But some protection is better than none. And I think there is a consensus that these vaccines are safe to be given and uh, that people do mount some immune response to these uh, vaccines and it may be beneficial. In contrast, live vaccines, and that's things like uh, yellow fever and measles, and I got a little one minute notice here. Uh, mumps and uh, the old uh, uh, smallpox vaccine are absolutely contraindicated for people who have significant immune deficiency. And the reason is uh, for adults with significant immune deficiency. And the reason is that you can get sick from the vaccine. Uh, there was a report actually from the army of a service person who got a smallpox vaccine, which by the way, no one should be getting anymore, who developed disseminated uh, uh, infection from the vaccine and was very, very ill as a result of it. So that's a lesson that we learned. Um, the, I think I'll leave the other questions to the other people since I've done my minute. Next speaker is Dr. Lawrence. I'll um, just continue down the list. It's Dr. William is going to be a hard act to follow. Um, in terms of the next question that was asked about steroid medications and aspirins and other drugs that are used in H AIDS patients or in individuals who just are carrying the HIV virus, it's a little bit more complicated because there are situations in which you would, some of these medications would be absolutely life-saving. And in longer, prolonged use of some of these um, therapies, they may actually lead to uh, either activation of latent virus or um, further an immune deficiency. And one of the, the biggest problems is the use of steroid treatments. Um, it's been shown in a number of centers that individuals suffering from severe cases of pneumocystis pneumonia, the most common pneumonia associated with the HIV virus, will often benefit for short terms, from short-term steroid therapy. And yet, you may have all have heard that steroids have lots of side effects and steroids are immune suppressant. In fact, steroids are used in a lot of diseases that have an, auto, have an overactive immune system, like autoimmune diseases, to calm it down. And what we're concerned about is the long-term use of steroid medicines in some of these patients. And the data is still conflicting. Um, one of the most common things that a person with AIDS or even a person who is carrying the HIV virus might be confronted with in terms of meeting long steroid therapy would be a low platelet count, something known as thrombocytopenia. Relatively low platelet counts are quite common in people who are carrying HIV. Severe platelet count uh, lowerings are, are luckily uh, much less common, but they're treated with steroids. And usually you give a lot of this medicine um, three times a day for upwards of a month and then see what happens. And then in those individuals that respond well, you may lower the dose and individuals you may need you may be able to take them completely off some individuals, and it may be upwards of 40% get better spontaneously without any therapy after that. And sometimes you need to consider other therapies. Um, and there is some evidence, and again, it's not in large controlled trials that we'd like to see it, that the more steroid that you take for the longer period of time, the worse it is. Um, that individuals who are treated for low platelet counts for a prolonged period of time, and I'm not talking about just the month periods, will go on to develop and AIDS-related illness quicker than if you had left them alone. And so that's still an, an area of controversy. The use of aspirin in people with low platelet counts, well, one aspirin, one time a week, will change the surface of a platelet and will make it able to clot less well. One aspirin, even one baby aspirin with one drink, will severely affect your, the ability of your platelets to clump. Now, luckily, most people who are healthy and are not carrying HIV it's of absolutely no consequence that they take one aspirin with one drink or whatever. You can measure a, um, a test tube abnormality. You can measure a slightly prolonged bleeding time if you stuck a needle in your ear, which is unlikely. Um, but it clinically, maybe not so unlikely, but clinically it doesn't, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't have that much of an effect. You may be asked about it if you're presented for surgery. If you're carrying HIV and are one of those individuals um, that has a low platelet count and, do, and doesn't know about it, then that aspirin, in, especially in, um, with the use of alcohol, might adversely affect you, and it's something your physician would tell you to avoid, and you'd want to avoid it. You can take Tylenol, you can take something else that's not an aspirin-like drug, and you cannot drink. Um, in terms of 
um, extensive medications with antibiotics, um, hopefully antibiotics are only prescribed when you need them. Um, and so even though some antibiotics have been associated with birth defects on animals and other antibiotics and prolonged use in very high doses might have some adverse effects on the immune system, that's not, hopefully that's not anything that anyone would be doing. Um, no one's really mentioned the word cofactors um, yet. And I think everyone would agree that cofactors are important for AIDS. A lot of people want to know why if you take the upwards of a million and a half people in the United States and maybe 10 million worldwide infected with this virus, do we have only about 42,000 cases of AIDS in the United States? And what's happened to everyone else? Is it that they just haven't lived long enough to get AIDS? Um, what, ha what is going to happen? Is there going to be a plateau? As Dr. William mentioned, perhaps we see out 10 years from now that maybe 50% of individuals carrying this virus won't get it. Is there something that some people are doing right that the other 50% are doing wrong? In the test tube, cofactors are very important. Um, Dr. Baltimore, who won a Nobel Prize um, about, uh, God, 19 1972, I guess, for the discovery of the reverse transcriptase enzyme, the very enzyme that a lot of people are trying to make drugs against, we discovered it in mice, um, has found that if you take a healthy T cell and you plop in a um, herpes virus, any of the common herpes viruses, especially herpes simplex associated with genital ulcers and infections, that you turn on a normal protein in the body that can bind to a piece of the virus, of the AIDS virus, and cause a tremendous increase in AIDS virus at least theoretically in the test tube. Could that happen in man? What would happen if you had an overwhelming other virus infection and then got infected with the AIDS virus? What if you were carrying the AIDS virus and had an uncontrolled herpes virus infection, Epstein-Barr virus infection, CMV virus infection? Well, we don't really know. Those studies are still going on, but there are theoretical reasons why that might be cofactors for this disease, why that might activate a latent virus, why that might convert someone who's a, a relatively healthy asymptomatic carrier into someone who's going to develop a full blown disease quicker. A lot of people are asking these questions. A lot of scientists are working on it. In a patient, we don't truly know yet. And maybe someone else will uh, want to address the question about the treatment of these diseases in patients who are carrying HIV. <clears throat> Dr. Slonabend, would you continue? Well, maybe I, uh, I'll, I'll speak about the, the, the last question. Uh, there, there are two levels, of course, uh, with respect to treatments in AIDS. One is the, the disease itself, the underlying disease of the, of the immune system. The other uh, aspect, of course, are the complications of this underlying disease, which is predominantly um, infectious, uh, neoplastic, and some other uh, complications. Um, I'd like to make the case that um, a structured form of, of patient program of, of patient management uh, which is directed at these complicating infections can make a, quite an impact on survival. Now it is, although the infections that one sees in AIDS are in fact complications of an underlying disease, they are indeed the most immediate cause of morbidity and, so, and, uh, and of death in, in this disease. So if we can approach these these complications in a structured fashion and people who are at risk for them having identified these people and that, that issue has been discussed uh, somewhat, then can we devise a structured program of management that is um, uh, directed at firstly the early detection of these infections, the prevention of those infections that can be prevented and the rapid and vigorous treatment of these infections. It is the case that most of the infections, of course not all of them, are, are indeed treatable. They may not be curable but they are certainly treatable. And, um, and many, some of these infections indeed have tests that allow their early detection and therefore the earliest treatment. Now, what is meant by a structured program of patient management would be a regular schedule of patient visits uh, which would be individualized for, the, for each, each patient, that's in terms of the frequency with which these uh, 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 examinations are made. Uh, <coughs> the, the objective here is to examine a patient uh, and pick up at the very earliest time the, the, uh, a, a, an infection. And uh, one, <coughs> that we can do the, frequently approach this because we, we have some experience already as to where to, to uh, uh, look and how to respond to a patient's symptomatology. Um, <coughs> in terms of prevention, at this moment, uh, 
the, the infections that are preventable are firstly pneumocystis uh, communia pneumonia. Uh, this, the, the, this has been spoken about of, uh, whether the proof is in that in fact we can, we can prevent this pneumonia is, n is really not the point. We have a good likelihood of being able to prevent this particular infection in those at risk. Of other infections that can be prevented when they occur, herpes simplex can be in, in patients who get recurrent herpes simplex. We can and indeed I feel we should uh, with acyclovir prevent uh, recurrences of herpes infections. Um, <coughs> Uh, the, there is within our grasp, and hopefully this will happen before too long, uh, the ability to prevent some fungal infections with fluconazole, and this becomes a, a question of some urgency to um, uh, <coughs> uh, pro uh, provide evidence that in fact we can do so. Um, and um, the, the, with a regular schedule of, of, of patient examinations, which are directed in such a way that, that infections can be picked up at the earliest time and treatment started uh, rapidly, I, a, a quite a major impact, I think, can be made on, on, on uh, patient survival. Now, uh, as I said, some, some infections do have uh, some tests that allow their early detection so that one can actually start the treatments before the clinical manifestations have progressed too far. Uh, this may be um, the case, for example, there are, uh, with a rather rapid test for cryptococcal meningitis. One can do uh, a, a blood test in the case where one suspects this, and there may be a point to, in, as part of the formal management to put in regular screenings uh, with tests for those infections that we can easily detect at the earlier stage. Now, if, if we can, now none of this has anything to do uh, on the face of it with the underlying uh, immunological deficit, but as Dr. Lawrence has said, and I, I really agree with this and, and believe this to be the case, is that these, some of the opportunistic infections are themselves contributory to the overlying, uh, to the underlying rather immunodeficiency. And if we can do something to um, treat these infections, I think we not only will uh, uh, improve well-being as a result, but I think we may, we may also have some impact on the course of the disease, uh, of the underlying disease. Now, one, one comment in, in relation to patient management and its impact on survival, in this, there is some implication uh, on, uh, with respect to clinical research. If, in fact, patient management can make a difference in uh, survival, and I believe this really is true, that uh, with a structured form of patient management, we can make a difference. What does this say with respect to participation in a controlled clinical trial? Um, what it really means is that some individuals may be managed in a way that is different to other individuals and that the overall outcome of, uh, uh, in a trial may, will differ, but not as a result of the, of the trial of, an, of a potential AIDS treatment, but maybe as a result of differences in the management, the overall management of, of, of the patient. Um, I think this, what this says is that our, our clinical trials are going to have to be designed around the best kind of patient management we can provide, which will include the provision of, of, of prophylaxis for pneumocystis and uh, that these studies are going to be infinitely harder to do. If we remove pneumocystis as an endpoint in a study, sure, we will have a much more difficult time in designing a study that will, will demonstrate efficacy of a particular anti-AIDS agent. But we really have to confront this and uh, face the fact that we will have to design studies that would be more difficult to undertake. And as a starting point, we have to base these studies on the very best kind of patient management that we can provide. Um, before we, we get to the last speaker on this topic, who's going to be Dr. Keeling, we thought that perhaps what we should do after the panel discusses this issue is have our break and then have John James talk because we imagine people are getting tired. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the last speaker on this topic is Dr. Keeling. You, you know, you sit in a discussion like this and people in the audience watch all of us up here and we watch all of you out there too. And as I watch all of you, you look tired. And uh, that brings me to a statement about good news and bad news. The good news is that the previous three speakers have covered six or seven out of the eight questions on this uh, sheet, which leaves me in the caboose position without very much to say. The bad news is I've thought of some things to say anyway. <laughs> and what I'd like to do is to put those in terms of trying to answer with you the seventh, uh, sixth question here about the access to medical care. I'm going to put that in a framework of ways that people interact with a healthcare system. 
which is an issue implied in some of our discussions back in the first panel and will be, I think, important in the rest of this as well. Let me introduce you to a term called medical phenomenology. And phenomenology in medicine means the way that physicians interpret and understand information and the way they deal with data. And your encounter with medical phenomenology might start, for example, if you come to see a physician, me, and you say your stomach hurts. And that is data, your stomach hurts. You think you have an ulcer. My reaction to that will be probably to try to do some tests and determine whether you have an ulcer or not. If I do those tests and my tests say you don't have an ulcer, I then look at you and I say you don't have an ulcer. You say, but my stomach hurts. I say, you don't have an ulcer. You say, but my stomach still hurts. I say, maybe you should see a psychiatrist. <laughs> and the point here is that the way physicians and individual people handle information sometimes is commonly different. And if I say to you, this must be all in your head, you will very rightly say back to me, but it's not my head that hurts. This uh, has to do with uh, lots of other things that have to do with these discussions. Um, and it has most notably to do with things like uh, monitoring T lymphocyte levels. And we have created in the process of doing this a surrogate answer for the question, is there something wrong? And very much as the way we do tests for ulcers, we do tests now for immune competency and try to find a way that we as physicians can relate to that's numerical and measurable and easy to reproduce that tells us whether there's something wrong or not. And there are lots of questions, there are lots of tests available that you've heard some about tonight, everything from CD4 levels to things you haven't heard about to gamma interferon levels and a variety of other things. It's unreally, really unclear what the role of those things is, what they measure. Uh, it's worth emphasizing that there are increasing amounts of data in medical literature that tell us that the correlation between your T4 level and what happens to you is not that great. And I fear sometimes that people will look at their T lymphocyte levels as prophecies which will eventually be self-fulfilled by their reaction to depressing information they get on a numerical study, which may not be an adequate reflection of what's going on. In a way, it's like weather forecasting, I think, that you want to ask the question, is it going to rain? And you know from watching weather forecasts how accurate the answer to that question is that you get from the National Weather Service or anywhere else, which is that you have no idea whether it will rain or not based on what the weather forecaster tells you. Similarly, based on what I tell you about your T4 level, you may not have any idea whether it's going to rain or not. And ultimately speaking, the only way you'll know is to walk outside and see if you get wet. This leads me to worry that we not put too much emphasis on these things. On the other hand, they have important roles in determining some thresholds and determining what we do and what we don't do with some toxic therapies. And I only mean to suggest that these things are not probably infallible and that we are not infallible as we use them. This takes me to a, uh, a kind of a comment more relevant to this question I'm supposed to answer that's left over for me here. And let me answer it by saying what I think the enemy here is. And the enemy for people concerned or infected with this virus is not just HIV. Uh, the enemy is not even just herpes simplex virus or Epstein-Barr virus, hepatitis B virus or pneumocystis or a variety of other things. The enemy is also despair and hopelessness and depression. The enemy is also homophobia and discrimination and prejudice. 